Jaya Nityananda, Jaya Dvaita Chandra, Jaya Gaur Bhakta Vrinda, Madhya Leela, Chapter 22, Verse 32. Vijala Manasya Yasya, Stano Ikshapate Muya, Vimohito Vikarpante, Mamahamiti Durdidaha. Translation, the external illusionary energy of Krishna, known as Maya, is always ashamed to stand in front of Krishna, just as darkness is ashamed to remain before the sunshine. However, that Maya bewilders unfortunate people who have no intelligence. Thus, they simply boast that this material world is theirs and that they are its enjoyer. Purport. The entire world is bewildered because people are thinking, this is my land. America is mine. India is mine. The UK is mine. Not knowing the real value of life, people think that the material body and the land which, where it is produced are all in all. This is the basic principle behind nationalism, socialism, and communism. Such thinking would simply bewilder the living being is nothing but rascalism. It is due to the darkness of Maya. As soon as one becomes Krishna conscious, he is immediately relieved from such misconceptions. This verse is quoted from Srimad Bhagavatam 2.5.13. There is also another appropriate verse in Srimad Bhagavatam 2.7.4.7. Shasva prashantam abhaya padi bodamatram sudam samad sarasa paramatma tadvam sabdo nayatra puru pura kavam prityartam mayam paradyabi muke chavila jamana vai padam bhagavata paramasma pum samba meti avidu ajasra sutam svishokam. Translation, what is realized is the absolute Brahman is full in unlimited bliss without grief. This is certainly the ultimate phase of the supreme enjoy of the personality of Godhead. He is eternally devoid of all disturbances, fearless, complete consciousness of oppo as opposed to matter, uncontaminated and without distinctions. He is the principal primeval cause of all causes and effects, in whom there is no sacrifice for food and activities, in whom the illusionary energy does not stand. This verse was spoken by Lord Brahma when he was questioned by the great sage Narada. Narada was surprised to see the creator of the universe meditating, for this indicated there might be someone greater than Lord Brahma. While answering the great sage Narada with bewildered living entities, this verse was spoken in that connection. Is there more? I can't see. No, go back, go back, go back, go back. I can't see the end of the last verse. So. Okay, okay. Thank you. Namaste, Nirvisesa sunyavari pasyatya de satarne. Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Guru Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasa Vidur Bhakta Vindam. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So if someone comes and comes into your house and picks up something, some item from your house and said, this is mine. 
um, he'll be known as a thief otherwise, or someone who is crazy, either one. Um, therefore, the living entities, when they come to the material world, they have this misconception that whatever they have belongs to them, or whether they, whatever they can control, apparently control, belongs to them. But the living entity comes into the material energy empty-handed, and he leaves empty-handed. Mm -hmm. One great, uh, powerful conqueror, Alexander the Great. He had many good qualities, although he was a powerful and very, and how would we say, avaricious conqueror. Uh, when he uh, he said that one of the things you should do when I die is that when you carry me to my gravesite, uh, carry me on the palanquin with my hands, both sides draped outside. And then they asked him why, because he said, well, uh, I'm leave I'm going to let everybody know that even though I had so much, I'm leaving with nothing. So this is the situation. In the meantime, the living entity tries to control and enjoy the property of the Supreme Lord. And that is another form of thievery. Because this is Mama Maya, Krishna says, Maya Dakshena Prakriti Suyate Satchurachara. He creates the material energy. He controls the material energy. Bhaktaram yagya tapasam sarvaloka maheshwara. Suidam sarabhutanam shantam yam matamichtati. But the Lord is so kind that he allows the living entities to use his property for their maintenance. And in some case, for whatever little bit of enjoyment they can eke out in the material world. But they should know nothing belongs to them. So this idea, this is my land and this is mine. Janasamoham Yam Maham Mameti. It's mentioned in the Bhagavatam. This is the one of the illusions of the living entity. Maham Mameti. Janasamoham Yam Maham Mameti. That but this belongs to me and I am this. All of these are false designations or false surreptitious states of consciousness that have been adopted simply because the living entity is in the illusion that they're this body. So when they think they're this body, anything in connection with the body, they think belongs to me, either directly or indirectly. But nothing belongs to the living entities. Just one, one time, one devotee said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I want to renounce everything. And Prabhupada said, what do you have to renounce? There's nothing to renounce. Nothing belongs to you in the first place. It's just like if you steal something from someone, then you say, well, I'll just renounce it. You can't renounce it because it wasn't, it's not yours anyway. So this is the living entity under this false, false conception that uh, things in relationship to me belong to me remains an illusion and therefore the living entity struggles hard to enjoy something that doesn't belong to them and that's called a hard struggle for existence uh, therefore as soon as we take on a material body we adopt these these false consciousness because as soon as you have a material body you identify that material body as you and the different designations that come with it, like, like being a mother, being a wife, being female, being male, being a CEO in a particular corporation. In other words, the I principle in terms of the relationship to the body is very strong and is very profuse. There's so many I identities that we take on only because we have a material body. And then we have the mind principle, 
that the possessions that we have belong to us. And therefore we can use it and enjoy it as we see fit. But all of these things are bewildering consciousness. And as Prabhupada said, it's nothing but rascalism. <laughs> so this is the, this is the uh, dictations of the illusionary energy, which comes by accepting a material body. But when the living entity wakes up to the reality that, that um, what is it? Nothing belongs to me. Everything belongs to the person who created it. It's just like we use the example. Uh, if you go into a, a photo gallery with many pictures on the walls, you can uh, take part in, enjoy, in looking at the pictures and then finding some enjoyment from that. But you can't say it's my picture because the person who actually painted it, that belongs to them, using that as an example. So Krishna has created and also controls this material energy. So it's him, it's Mama Maya. He said, this is my energy. And this material energy is very strong. So then he says, the only way you can get out of this consciousness is you have to take shelter of me in devotional service. And part of that understanding <clears throat> is the activity of using the things in this world for the service of the Lord. And this is the platform of happiness. We we'll try to understand this principle because it's very important. When you realize nothing belongs to you and everything you have, you're using it. You use some of it for your personal needs. So you, maybe you need some medicine, you need a house to live in, you need some food like that. You have some personal needs. So Krishna allows that. He said, all right, since you're in the material world, you need certain things. So it's my energy, but use it for your own upkeep, for your own maintenance. But then again, beyond that, whatever else we have, that we interact with should be seen in relationship to the source. And that, that seeing is activity in devotional service. I use what Krishna gives me. And therefore, I'm always happy because Krishna may give me a lot, Adibo, or Krishna may give me a little, Adibo. It doesn't really matter because none of it belongs to me. And if I have something and it's no longer available, fine. It's not mine in the first place. Uh, it's under in the Christian tradition. Uh, they have a, this particular saying from the Baptist uh, sector of Christianity. They say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the Lord. <laughs> So in any way, he gives and he takes away. So the devotees can be happy in his, we usually have a tendency to be happy when he gives. But when he takes away, then there's a whole different mood that comes in. <laughs> People like God, when he provides whatever they want or whatever they need. But when he does the opposite, according to their understanding of what they need and what they want, they have a different attitude. They sometimes condemn God or, or find fault with God or uh, start becoming very despondent. But we should all know that the time of death, everything is going to be gone anyway. So therefore nothing belongs to us, but we can pay use it in the service of the Lord. But those who are absorbed in material energy and make Maya their worshipable object, try to accumulate and control more and more of the material energy. And they're always in anxiety. As Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 16th chapter, they, there's no limit to their, their desires to control and enjoy, and there's no limit to the anxieties that come with that. Just like in the 15th canto, uh, I'm not sorry, in the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, 
there are 15 uh, anomalies or bad qualities that come with money. Those who are wealthy bring about 15 negative qualities, such as enviousness, enmity. Uh, what else? I can't remember all of the 15. There's a whole list in the, that chapter of the Avanti Brahman. The Avanti Brahman was an interesting person. He was rich. He had everything. And he was always trying to get more. But he was such an, a miser that uh, people would come around him to get what they could from him, which wasn't very much. Even his family members were not getting what they wanted or what they needed. And But then at one point, his faith in life changed and he lost everything. He was completely penniless. He had nothing. And everybody gave him up. They never liked him in the first place, but they stuck with, they stuck with him because he had some wealth. When the wealth was gone, everybody left him. So he describes in his situation how he, uh, after losing everything, he, he, he describes his happiness now because uh, he had, now he can focus on devotional service. Before he was just focusing on getting more and exploiting the living entities around him for more and more. So this is the material energy. And you see, you see people who are very wealthy, they're never satisfied. They always want more wealth. I even personally know certain devotees who are big businessmen. And they have a lot of money, I mean millions, and still they can't stop working. They can't stop accumulating, getting more and more and more. It becomes something like a disease where the more they have, the more they want. And the more they get, the better they feel. But then if they lose something, it becomes a catastrophe. So this is the this is the greed and the lust. All of these qualities come with accumulation of wealth. And when wealth is used in the service of the Lord, it is uh, it brings one to Krishna consciousness. Uh, just like we have Ravana. Ravana had so much wealth. <laughs> I mean, he had a city made out of gold. Prabhupada said he, uh, he had a brother living in a place called, which we now know in, uh, as Brazil. Brazil is a country that is quite wealthy with gold mines. So Prabhupada would say that his brother would ship large quantities of gold underground. There was an underground tunnel from uh, Brazil to Lanka. And that's how he got all of his gold. And he made this big city. And he accumulated wealth, followers, prestige. He had everything. He was also very intelligent, very good looking also. But he was never satisfied. So much so that even the wife of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he, he had to have that too. He wasn't satisfied. I mean, he had the best of the, he had the most loyal followers. He had the best of all wives, Mando Dari. She was, she's glorified as being one of the most chaste and faithful ladies in the history of Vedic culture. He had everything, <laughs> but he's never satisfied. So this is, this is what happens in this material world. People, the more they get, the more they want, and the less they're satisfied. And all I think is getting more. And if I can get more, it gives them some temporary feeling of satisfaction. But in the end, or even right after that, they want to try to get more and more and more. But therefore, in the, in the pastime of, uh, of uh, Bhamanadev, when he went to see Bali Maharaj in his palace, 
He came as a dwarf Brahmana, a small little boy. He was a supreme personality of God, had born from Aditya and Kashyapa. He, he appeared from them. And his mission was to recapture all of the, the wealth stolen by Bali Maharaj from Indra. He had captured all the three worlds and everything was under his control. And but one of the good qualities of Bali, although he was the king of the demons, is that he would love to give in charity to Brahmanas. So Brahmana Dev came as a little dwarf Brahmana. He had this deer skin and he also had a, a Brahmin thread. And when Bali saw him, he was immediately attracted to his beauty. That was, that was the quality of Brahmana Dev. He was so beautiful. And anyone see, would see him immediately, their minds would become absorbed in his beauty. And uh, so welcoming Vamana Dev really nicely and uh, sweet words, gave him a seat of honor, so many things. He said, I am, you know, I'm prepared to give you anything you want. Just ask for me and it'll be yours. Ramana Dave didn't answer his questions directly. And finally, the Lord said, well, just give me three steps of land. That's all. Bali said, you're so small. Three steps? That's nothing. I'm prepared. I could give you an island. I could give you a planet. <laughs> Ramana Dave said, no, just three steps of land. And then when he was persistent, Bali, Ramana Dave said, well, actually, one who is not satisfied with, the, with what they need will never be satisfied. <laughs> so this was a very powerful statement that Ramana Dave gave to, to all of us that if we have what we need, then that's satisfaction. If we get a little bit more, we can use that for Krishna consciousness. And whatever we have, it belongs to Krishna. So therefore, one should always live in that mood because detachment to, from Maya means attachment to Krishna. We become attached to using what Krishna gave, give us. Our intelligence is one thing. Our time is another thing. Our wealth, that's another thing. Our, uh, our resources around us whatever we can generate, that's another thing. So a devotee is always thinking, what else can I use in Krishna's service? Or what, or what else can I do to make the service to Krishna more and more better? So sometimes we make some endeavor to get some, some more resources simply to improve the quality of our service. But that's not a big thing. That's something that comes by way of one's devotional sentiment. Oh, I want to make this better with that. Just like you, know, you have a deity and you think, oh, well, I have a deity and I worship him, but I want to make I want to make the altar even nicer. So let me get some more decorations, let me get some more things to, to make the altar even more beautiful. That's devotional service. That's the devotional service. We try to increase the quality and the uh, quantity of whatever we have and use it for Krishna's service. That's it. And don't worry, devotees never starve. Krishna always takes care of his devotees. <laughs> Even if the rest, of the rest of the world is undergoing starvation, the devotees will never starve because they are engaged in devotional service. That is a fact. Krishna will always see that devotees have everything they need to serve nicely and to live in a comfortable situation. That is Krishna's mercy. The demons sometimes try to create scarcity by, uh, by, by putting so many restrictions on whatever you have and whatever you do, but they can't overshadow Krishna's mercy upon the devotee. The devotee is always giving the mercy of Krishna. And therefore, devotees are always satisfied. But those who are, you know, worshiping Maya, 
as it says here, Maya cannot stand in front of Krishna, she has to stand behind Krishna. Just like the darkness cannot go in front of the sun. So in the same way, if the devotee keeps Krishna in front, Maya remains automatically behind, and then there's no Maya. But as soon as we divert our attention away from Krishna and towards the material energy for enjoyment, then Maya becomes prominent in our activities. And Maya means that which is not. She presents something to be, something that can give happiness and satisfaction, but it turns out to be the opposite. That is Maya. The devotees are always satisfied with whatever Krishna gives, and if he gives more, then uh, they're, they're happy. If he takes it away, they do not lament. And they always find opportunities to serve Krishna in every, any, in all situations they're in. Uh, our Harinam is going out, um, the devotees are going out on Harinam tonight. It's a Maha Harinam here in Ljubljana. So you hear some kirtan in the background, that's what that is. Okay, so thank you very much and uh, Hare Krishna. Thank you so much Guru Maharaj. And devotees, if you have any questions, comments, realizations, please um, unmute yourself and ask questions. And uh, it would be nice if you can keep your cameras on while you know, you know, you, um, during the discussion. And if you want, you can type in the chat box and I'll read it for you. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Okay, so. Any questions? We don't have Sri Devi to start off our question and answer session tonight because she's out on Hari now. So, Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Namrata, thank you. Okay. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Srila Prabhupada, all glory to you, Maharaj. Uh, my question is, uh, I have two questions, Maharaj. Uh, one is, uh, what is the significance of uh, three steps land? Three step land. Uh, what Bali, uh, what Vamana Dev is asking. Well, that that's related to Vamana's plan to take away everything from Bali, and then Bali after. Uh, granting Vamanadev three steps of land, the Lord took his steps and then he expanded himself. He was no longer a dwarf Vaman, he was the size of the universe. And the first step, he took all the property of the middle planets and the lower planets. On the second step, he took all of the higher planets and everything. In two steps, the Lord took everything away from Bali. And then, uh, then the Lord said, you have promised me three steps. You, I've only taken two. And there's no other place for my third step. So uh, you're a thief. You promised me something and you can't fulfill your promise. <laughs> the Lord got pretty heavy with Bali. <laughs> So the Lord tricked Bali by doing that. Okay, Maharaj. Uh, so that is just uh, to trick Bali, uh, Bali Maharaj. Uh, there's yeah. nothing more. The Lord's, the Lord's steps are not like our steps. <laughs> but Bali couldn't see that at first. He was thinking the Lord is like us. But when the Lord took his steps, two steps, he covered all, all the planetary systems higher and lower throughout creation. Okay, Maharaj. Uh, 
uh, is it fine if I ask my second question or should I uh, let other, others also ask? Well, I don't see any other questions coming up, so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll go ahead with my second question. So I wanted to ask um, about Maya. I think you uh, you discussed this in uh, yesterday's lecture also that why uh, Maya uh, serves demons. Uh, so from that, I wanted to ask: Is Maya free to act independently from Krishna? No. No, she works under the direction of the Supreme Personality of God, and she's one of his energies. I mean, she's a total obedient entity, but she's powerful. Shristi Sisti Palaya Sadeka Jayeva Bibhati Durga. She is the shadow energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. She can create, she can maintain, she can destroy. She's very powerful, but she's not independent. It's like the shadow is never independent of the image of the person. The shadow is simply the image of the person. So the shadow can never be different than, or different than the person or independent of the person. So Maya in the same way, she's powerful, but she works under the direction of Krishna. Maya dakshena prakritik suyate sachirachiram. Krishna says, it's my energy. And she's working under my direction. So Krishna puts the energies. He, he creates the energies and he gives them work in a certain way. And then they work according to his direction. Okay. But then Maya is not independent now. So when uh, Maharaj, Ma, uh, when demons serve Maya to get some benedictions or to get some material things, so even that comes under the plan of Krishna? Yeah. Okay. Which makes up the material energy. So the demons are more or less in the modes of passion and ignorance. So when the modes of passion and ignorance are prominent, the demons are in control, they're powerful. It's like today, in today's world, the demons are very powerful. And so because people are not pious, people are irreligious, people are sinful, therefore the demons are prominent. <laughs> but if people become pious, and religious, then the demigods become prominent, and the demons are pushed to the side. So the whole world is so sinful, people are just absorbed in irreligious and sinful activities. And therefore, the demons are powerful. Okay, Maharaj, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Uh, if you read, if you read the, the seventh canto, first first chapter in the seventh canto, verse number eight, it'll explain how Krishna remains neutral when it comes to the material energy. Okay. He's neutral. I'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Then if you understand that verse, you can understand why, how Krishna acts or doesn't act in relationship to the material energy. But he's always acting for his devotees. The devotees are not influenced by the material energy as, as much as they take shelter of Krishna. And therefore they become free from that influence. But if we don't take shelter, or we take shelter partly, then to that degree we are we are still influenced by material energy. Okay. Material energy is powerful. It, it rules the material world. This is called the word, this is called Durgadam. Mm. 
Durga, the word Durga, Dur means go. And no, Dur means, the Dur means fort, fort, like a fort. Durga, go, yeah. Durga, Durga. Yes, Durga means fort. Durga means, Dur means fort and go means to go, to, to leave or difficult. The word go means difficult in this sense. So to get out of a fort is very difficult. The fortress is keeping the living entities bound up. So Durga, this is Durgadam. She's the controller of the material energy. She's powerful. So everyone is serving Durga. Yes, Maharaj. Thanks, Except the devotees, they're the devotees are serving Krishna. We're not serving Durga. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dur but Durga is, a, Durga is a servant of Krishna. Yes. So it is very necessary for us to be devotees. Yes. And, yeah, unless you want to suffer the the pangs of material energy, yeah. The more you become the devotee, the more you take shelter of Krishna, the more you're protected by Krishna, the more you're elevated by Krishna. So if you're using 50% of your time and energy in Krishna consciousness, then you're 50% Krishna conscious. If you do 70%, you're up to that, you're, that's your percentage. But when you're 100% engaged in devotional service, then you're fully situated on the spiritual platform. You have nothing to do with this material energy. Although you may still interact with the material energy, it doesn't become, it's not material anymore. It's pure, it's, it becomes the energy to elevate you to Krishna. <laughs> So we can choose where do we, we can, we can put our attention on, on the material energy or on the spiritual energy, on devotional service or on uh, trying to enjoy in this material world. Yes, Maharaj. Enjoyment is devotional service. Come again, Maharaj, you said enjoyment is devotional service. Yeah, real enjoyment or actual actual enjoyment is devotional service. Yeah. Okay. Okay, 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 I got it. Thank you. We, we can't enjoy the material energy because the material energy is, is different than our nature. We are spirit and material energy is matter. So if you take yeah. a fish and you put it, you take a fish and you put them on the sand, and you give them a nice fish palace or give them a nice fish car. They can drive around in the sand. Uh, he's he's going he's gonna to want to go back in the water because it's not his nature. So we're trying to enjoy something we can't enjoy. That's the material energy. And that's why we suffer because it's contrary to our nature. We're spiritual. We're not material. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, even I, I have noticed many times that whenever we try to enjoy the material energy, either we end up, you know, if we even if we get out of one thing, we land up in another thing. So yeah. there's, <laughs> there's no way out from material energy unless we are taking the shelter of Krishna. Exactly. One material thing leads to another, leads to another. The fort is, is fortified on all sides. You can't get out. Yes. yes. But Krishna is Mukunda. Mukunda means giver of liberation. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of using our 
uh, resources, time, and energy in the service of the Lord. That's all. How that service is executed, there is a variety of ways to execute the service. But the idea is to stay in that energy by always engaging in devotional service. Or preparing ourselves in making arrangements to engage in devotional service. That is also part of devotional service. Thank you. So that's, that's where the spiritual master comes in to tell you this is this is how you can serve and this is how you can make advancement. He guides you, he gives you suggestions, you learn from others, you learn from this from the, the local temples, the local yatra leaders. We can always find ways to serve. And especially right now, the opportunity for service is great with book distribution. This is a time where doing books is, is probably the best service one can do at this particular time. But that's a suggestion. That's just something that everyone's doing now with the Christmas marathon on. The devotees are finding ways to distribute books in different ways. It's like those of you who live in the UK. I don't see too many UKers on here. Let's see, we got Raj, we got DD, PKDD. We got, who else we got in the UK here? Um, just like there's a, there's a problem called the Gita project. I was just privy to the project just recently. And they're putting Prabhupada's books in police stations, nursing homes, courts, shops, uh, libraries, prisons. They have the, in the last year, they, they distributed 100,000 books different agencies all over the UK. And it's a Shastra Don program. That's one way to distribute books is Shastra Don. You, you buy, you go to your temple or some facility and you buy maybe a hundred Gitas and then you distribute those Gitas to, to different places. You don't have to sell them or try to sell them. We just distribute them to whoever who will ever take them. That's called Shastra Don. For those of you who are too, uh, those of you who are difficult, find difficulties going out and distributing books, the, the Shastra Don program works nicely. Just purchase a large amount of books and distribute them. Give them to your friends for Christmas. <laughs> like that or you know different ways so we all have money so we can you know you may not be able to go out and do book distribution on the streets but we can do something to distribute books like that maharaj in the local temple here in uh mira road mumbai they have uh, kept a you know, beam balance, a big beam balance. And uh, they, uh, they have uh, made arrangements that if, if somebody wants to, like uh, if somebody wants to uh, weigh Bhagavad Gita equal to the uh, weight of their child, you know, the little <laughs> infants and toddlers, and then they want to donate that. Well, that's that's so nice. <laughs> That's, that's a nice way. Think of different ways to distribute books. Yeah. I think in India, people would like that concept. Yeah, they, they go for such type of concepts. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mataji. I think Raj Prabhu, you have a question. Thank you, Mataji. Thank you, Mataji. 
Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to yourself, Maharaj. Maharaj, I really, I really liked your, uh, the sentence you said earlier. Uh, nothing belongs to me. Everything belongs to Krishna. And whilst we heard this so many times and we know that everything belongs to Krishna, we still kind of like to say, oh, this is my body. This is my home. This is my car. So how can we, and if we did realize that properly, it would change our behavior so much. So my question is, how can we, how can we really develop? Are, are, you, a, are you a homeowner? Are you a homeowner or do you rent? A uh, homeowner. You're a homeowner. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. Now, say you were a person who was renting. So if you rent an apartment and you come into the apartment, you say, this is my apartment. It's not. <laughs> You're paying rent to use it. That's all. Yeah. So, the, so we, we, we rent places to live. But we don't say it's my, it's mine, it doesn't belong. If the landlord says time's up, you're out. <laughs> you're out. <laughs> Can't stay. They have the say. So at the same time, we just we just temporarily come into this world and we're using so many things. And if we claim it's ours, then that's just that's a form of insanity. <laughs> Maharaj, how can we develop that that realization that everything belongs to Krishna, that this is not my body, I've just been given it temporarily? Oh, the, fact is, the fact is you can't keep it. <laughs> You're going to have to give it up sometime. It's not, and we don't, we don't willingly give it up. So we, at mm. the end, we have to reluctantly give everything up. Mm. So we come in with nothing and we leave in the same way. So we can use Krishna's energy for our livelihood. You know, Krishna gives you food. He gives you, you know, a place to stay. Other things that we need to maintain our body and soul together is being provided by the material energy coming from Krishna. Material energy is the provider also. Well, that's nice. And you can enjoy these things when you use them in Krishna service. Otherwise, they become sources of, you know, well, I have something I want to enjoy, but I can't enjoy it. So then there's anxiety. But if you give up the idea of trying to enjoy, then there's no anxiety. All you do is you engage in devotional service, which is susukam kartam avyayam. Krishna says devotional service is pleasurable. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. So, yeah. You look in the mirror and you say, Mr. Raj, that's not me. <laughs> that's my body. I'm something different than my body. I'm looking at myself, who, who I think is me, but is not me. <laughs> so whatever we want to enjoy is in relationship to the body, which is not you in the first place. <laughs> It's also part of Krishna's energy. <laughs> Even your body doesn't belong to you. <laughs> That's nice. I was only meditating on this very th subject this morning. I was writing a poem where every line started, I am not this body, I am a topic spirit soul. Nice. Make a book out of it. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj.
Thanks, Raj Prabhu. So we will we look forward to uh, read your uh, see your poem and and the book. Uh, uh, Shilpa Mataji, you have a question. Yes. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, all Guru to Sila Prabhu and all Guru to Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So I have a question about that you discussing with the Namrata Mataji about Durga Ma and Maya. Durga Mata Ji and Maya. So and my question, because one of my friends, he sees a devotee of Durga Ma, and she was, we were discussing, we were talking, and she was telling me that her Guru Maharaj told her that Durga Ma is expanded form from the Radha Rani. So I was just a little confused. Is it like true? Is there like Durga is an expanded, expanded form from the Radha Rani or Krishna or how is this? Well, it says in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, all female manifestations are expansions of Srimati Radharani. And she expands in three categories. She expands in the, as the gopis, the lakshmis, and the queens of Dwarka. And these are the three categories of expansions. So when you take um, then they expand, those persons expand into the material manifestations of the female forms, such as, um, now like Krishna's sister, Subhadra. When Krishna was born, his sister also appeared, Subhadra. Now Subhadra is Yoga Maya, and she is the female energy, which is the energy which hides Krishna, from the non-devotees and reveals Krishna to the devotees. Now her expansions are all the material expansions. So Yoga Maya, although she's spiritual, she expands herself into, this is mentioned in the Bhagavatam in the 10th canto, during the time when Kamsa had captured the, that the girl of Devaki and was going to kill her. He was about to dash her on a rock. She flew up in the sky and she manifested her eight-armed form as Durga. And then she spoke to Kamsa, you can't kill me. Uh, and then in that particular Leela, it's described that she expands herself into different forms. She's Chandi, she's Ambika, she's Vijaya, she's Durga. She's Bhadra, Bhadra Kali, different manifestations of the uh, external energy. So Radharani expands only in the spiritual manifestations, but the spiritual manifestations, when the material energy is there, Yoga Maya, who's Purnamasi in Vrindavan, appears also as the external energy in Krishna's pastimes, but she's completely spiritual. So Durga is not directly related to an expansion of Radharani, not at all. So it's an but, external energy, is it external energy? Or? Yeah, Radharani is the complete internal energy. She's pure, she not, has nothing to do with the external energy. But Yoga Maya, who is an expansion of Srimati Radharani, expands herself into the external energies as Durga, Kala, you know, uh, Bhadra Kali, and all of the different names of Durga Devi that manifests herself throughout the creation. She's known by different names in different places. She's also the wife of Lord Shiva. Parvati, Sati, Amba. These are all names of, of the external energy who is the wife of Lord Shiva. So the expansions of the expansions of the expansions, but Radharani is not directly connected with the material expansions. She's only expand, she only expands in the forms of the spiritual expansions. The queens of Vrindavan, the gopis in Vrindavan and the Lakshmis in Vaikuntha. Well, when Krishna wants to create the material world, 
Lakshmi manifests herself in her material form as Durga Devi for the sake of creation. She's also known as Rama Devi during the actual creation. So all of these are different female personalities that come ultimately from uh, coming ultimately from Radharani, but expanding it downward. But you can't say that Durga is an expansion of Radharani. It's too, because Durga is, is simply within the material energy, although she is Krishna's devotee, he's a pure devotee. And Radharani is, she is the internal energy of the Lord known as Ladini Shakti. <laughs> So to make that connection is quite remote. <laughs> it's a very thin connection. Okay. But you can say the Durga is the expansion of Yoga Maya, that's for sure. Okay. If you read the introduction to the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, you'll you'll get a, this. There's a whole, there's a three or four pages describing the yoga maya and maha maya and the relationship between the two. They're non different. <laughs> yoga maya is spiritual and maha maya is material. Now, Prabhupada would give the example of uh, electricity. Electricity is one energy. You plug it in, you plug a refrigerator into the electrical socket, it makes cooling. If you plug a heater into the electrical socket, you get heat. So the electricity is one, but it manifests itself in different ways according to the receptacle. So when we engage in devotional service, we're under the control, we're under the care of Yoga Maya and ultimately Srimati Radharani. When we engage in the material energy, we're under the care of Durga Devi and, and all of her manifestations. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. I hope, I hope that was clear. It's a little complicated. <laughs> yeah, it was just a little complicated. <laughs> but so I what I understood is like the Radharani's eternal energy expansion is like Gopi Lakshmi and uh, the queen of the Dwarkas. And her ex, uh, external energy is Yogamaya and then all those other devis. Yogamaya manifests that... yeah, Yoga Maya connects the material, spiritual with the material, like that. Yeah. And she is the consort of uh, Mahavishnu, mm -hmm. who is the expansion of the spiritual expansions for the sake of material creation. Okay. So when you when you get to Mahavishnu, then you start understanding a little bit of how the material energy works. Before then, everything is, Mahavishnu is pure spiritual energy. He is the Supreme Lord. But he connects with the external energy for the sake of, for the sake of creation. And he uses his female energy for, for assistance in that creation. And she's called Rama Devi. Mm -hmm. it's interesting you, it's, it's, it requires some reading and some study it's, it's interesting. interesting right mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you Guru Manas. thank you yeah Thanks. so to make that connection is a little bit the word is tenuous tenuous means very very thin to try to connect the Durga with Radharani as an expansion Thanks, Mataji. Uh, Guru Maharaj, Thank there you. is a question from um, um, Brad Prabhu. Um, so I'll, I'll read it out for you. Uh, it says, Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to you. All glories to La Prabhupada. Maharaj, how can we maintain this mood that Krishna stands, stands in front of Maya when we experience bitterness towards us from others? for excelling in some way in life, whether it is it be spiritual or material, whether or not these individuals are envious or bitter, how can we maintain a positive mood 
in this situation and see it as Krishna's mercy when someone else does not wish to see you excel. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the material world. The material world is a place of envy. You can expect that. The more you become successful, the more people will envy you. That's a fact. Your success in life creates envy towards others, for others towards you, even in spiritual circles like that. People will find ways to envy in so many different ways. It's just the way the material world is. This world, whole world evolves around enviousness. Everyone is, and en en because envy is the, uh, is the initial, uh, an artha which brought the living entity to the material world. We fall from the spiritual world because we want to enjoy separate from Krishna. And we want our own kingdom to enjoy, so here we are. And we take different bodies, life up to life, and talk to try to do that. And we find ourselves in competition with others. So this whole world is a competition with others. Well, one of the qualities of this material world is called Aribaltic, miseries by other living entities. You can't be peaceful in this world. It's not possible. Don't try. <laughs> no, people will not allow you to be peaceful. <laughs> it's just the way the world is. Even if you want to be peaceful, you can't be. It's just the world will not allow you to be peaceful because there's always people who will give you trouble. No matter who you are, no matter, you know, what position in life you are. It's just the way the world is. And envy is one of the motivating forces that, that pushes people in that direction. People are not happy within themselves and they're always looking towards others to somehow or other pull them down or make them feel less than they are, to push themselves up, to push other people down. That's envy. To kill animals, that's envy too. Prabhupada says, the animal has a right to live. It's been given by God, but you interfere with that right to live. That's enviousness of that living entity. That's envy also. So don't be surprised. This is the way the material world is. So to protect yourself, you have to engage in devotional service and not be affected by how people you know, see you or don't see you. Okay. Even Prabhupada was criticized, and he was a pure devotee. He came from the spiritual world to do this work. There were persons that were envious of Prabhupada also. Even his many of his disciples, not many, but some of his disciples were envious of him also. It's just the way it is. This is the world of envy. But take shelter of Krishna and take shelter of the holy name and be free from the effects of, you know, other people's negativity. That's it. Hare Krishna, thank you, Maharaj. I apologize on that work right now, but Hare Krishna, thank you so much. Thank you, Hare Krishna. We have two more questions. I can't stay too much longer because I have a program coming up tonight. In a few minutes, I have to leave for the program. So let's take the last two questions here. We have Suda and Swaha. If we can just give some quick questions and then we can move on. I'm sorry, it's just I have this program and I have to get going because <laughs> I have that's fine. So the Mat um, so the Mataji we can quickly uh, push uh, Yes. Um Hare thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Um, please ask uh, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Our glory is to love Prabhupada. Um so Guru Maharaj, my question is about like uh, um, it's related to today's topic. I was reading uh Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh this is about the uh, Pingala prostitute. So, like, uh, I was just trying to understand, like, you know, uh, as we get more and more attached to the lusty desires, um, I mean, like, um, um, you get entangled with that, right? So, but here in Pingala's story, like, uh, she was uh, filled with anxiety 
and she was like more disappointed and uh, and then she felt like detachment and from that situation she a uh, happiness arose in her mind so i was just trying to understand how the transition happened like uh, um because well yeah uh, her desires were not fulfilled and she was becoming frustrated and finally she got to the point of so much frustration she just gave up her desire okay when she gave up her desire all of the frustration was gone <laughs> okay so the more and more you entangle and finally if you that's, get disappointed that's that's how the de- that's how detachment works you're attached to something you really wanted and you struggle for it you don't get it you say no oh, i didn't get it life goes on <laughs> so giving up and uh, being uh, yeah. satisfied detachment gives you an this initial feeling of happiness but then you have to take it to the next step and become attached to krishna then you fulfill that need for attachment because no one can be free from attachment we have to be attached to either the external energy or the internal energy mm-hmm. yes very much so it's very important when detachment comes we should also attach to krishna again if not uh, that's if that's attach- that's a good that's a good time right at that time when it happens but you can do it anytime but when you do it that time there is such a feeling of happiness that comes with that thank you so much yeah. thank you so much a very beautiful class today so many things you know thank you thanks, thanks so much so how much ji you have a question Krishna dear gurudev um i just wanted to say if you are in a rush in a hurry so uh, i can ask tomorrow <laughs> okay <laughs> my my ride hasn't come yet i'm waiting for them to knock on the door so they haven't knocked yet so uh, you can go ahead and ask your questions <laughs> उट um how many persons we are um dedicating to the lord so much we become krishna consciousness uh, so i wanted to ask you because uh for example grihastas has to work and do so many things which are not actually um devotional service but at the end um they doing everything um for the lord i don't know it's more like like consciousness or or is actual service it's both but it's consciousness is the most important thing so i'm a devotee i want to be krishna conscious that's my main goal in life but i have a family i have a wife i have a home i have a job so i have to do that work but i'm not attached to these things I'm attached to becoming Krishna conscious but still I have to take care of these things and do them in the, in the proper way also that's all because I'm a devotee and that's the most important thing so these other things are parallel to our devotional service the problem is when we get attached to the results of our material activities and we become happy and distressed by the success or failure then these things drag us away from krishna into the material consciousness so yeah live your life as a devotee and uh, take care of your material responsibilities not too much just enough to keep body and soul together and use your time for krishna conscious that's that's grihastha life and that is that is one of the ways to practice krishna consciousness thank you very much but don't work all the 
don't work all the time. <laughs> Make sure there's enough time for Krishna. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah, thank you. Money is not the honey. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Swaha Mataji. Thank so you. Can, we can close the call, Guru Maharaj. I do have to go. I think I'm about ready to get a knock on the door. So <laughs> thank you all. And we'll see you on uh, tomorrow for Saturday for a continuation. And here comes the knock on the door right now. So just in time. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Hey, on Krishna Prabhupada. Prabhupada ki jai. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Gurudev. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mataji.